Lucy Bollinger is Columbia University's 19th president. He has held the job since 2002, making him the longest serving of the current Ivy League presidents. Having been on the Pulitzer board with President Bollinger for several years and on campus for three seasons, I know a few things about him. First, he usually hosts a lunch at the board's April meeting, and lunch at Lee's house is pretty great. Tasty food, cordial company. The discussion usually involves a first-hand account of a huge crisis somewhere in the world or some new and thorny challenge in journalism or higher education. Second, if you spend any time on this campus, you witness the varied, intense, and constant pressure on the president of Columbia University. Every day he wakes to the awesome task of guiding the future of the young people who come here. What should they be taught and how? How do you balance the demands of the marketplace with the goal of an educated populace? How can the university offer students a fair and open forum for free expression while guarding the rights of all? The answers are neither simple nor fixed. And just to cite two of President Bollinger's works, works in progress, he is leading the largest expansion of the campus's history while also turning Columbia into a global university. Third, President Bollinger is a valuable colleague on the Pulitzer, in Pulitzer board decisions about both arts and letters and journalism. In him, the board is blessed to have one of the top First Amendment lawyers and free speech advocates in the country. He is a member of the law school faculty at Columbia, and his latest book is titled Uninhibited, Robust, and Wide Open, A Free Press for a New Century. Today, as in past springs, President Bollinger will make a few remarks and hand out the Pulitzer Prizes. Lee? Well, th <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, Mike is a spectacular uh, new leader of the Pulitzer Board following Sig Gisler and uh, Seymour Toffey. I mean, this is a great tradition of, of great, great journalists uh, and people uh, heading this up. Um, I really just have two very quick things to say. Uh, the first is, uh, in my roles, as you can imagine, I participate in a lot of selection processes. There's none, there is none that matches the seriousness, the rigor, the integrity, and the sheer joy of selecting the Pulitzer Prizes. I mean, it is something that is really a wonder to behold, and you should feel very, very proud to have been the outcome of that uh, incredible process. The second is uh, I want to say that um, this is something that's extremely important for Columbia University. And this is one of the great universities of the world. And to have the Pulitzer Prizes here um, as its home is a, really something we, we all value tremendously. We also value freedom of expression and free speech, free press, and you, uh, I think, realize that uh, in many uh, ways. But I do want you to know that we are trying to build up the institutional capacity to work on these issues in every dimension, from bringing litigation, uh, to doing research, to doing teaching, to public advocacy, to trying to articulate why it is that these values are so important, not only in this country, but in the world. We have projects that um, are based in the journalism school, of course, one of the wonderful parts of the university, as well as in the law school and engineering. Um, and we are adding to those great programs. Uh, we have one on global free expression. We're now giving an award to the best judicial decision in the world for freedom of speech and press. And uh, just pay attention over the next few months, I think we'll have another major announcement uh, that will reinforce this enormous commitment of the university to try to preserve and enhance free speech, free press uh, here and around the world. So shall we uh, get started on the awards? So first is the citation for the Pulitzer Prize in Journalism for Public Service. 
for a distinguished example of meritorious public service by a newspaper or news site through the use of journalistic resources, including the use of stories, editorials, cartoons, photographs, graphics, videos, databases, multimedia or interactive presentations or other visual material. You can see how complicated this has gotten over the past 100 years. A gold medal, the Post and Courier, Charleston, South Carolina, for Tell Death Do Us Part, a riveting series that probed why South Carolina is among the deadliest states in the Union for women and put the issue of what to do about it on the state's agenda. Please come forward, Glenn Smith, Doug Pardue, Jennifer Barry Haas, <laughs> Natalie Carla Huff, and Mitch Pugh. Breaking news reporting. For a distinguished example of local reporting of breaking news that, as quickly as possible, captures events accurately as they occur and as time passes, illuminates, provides context, and expands upon the initial coverage. The Seattle Times staff, for its digital account of a landslide that killed 43 people, and the impressive follow-up reporting that explored whether the calamity could have been avoided. Please come forward, Mike Baker, Mike Lindblom, Mark Nolan, Paige Collins, and Lindsay Wasson. Congratulations. Investigative journal in journalism reporting. For a distinguished example of investigative reporting using any available journalistic tool, Eric Lipton of the New York Times for reporting, for reporting that showed how the influence of lobbyists can sway congressional leaders and state attorneys general, slanting justice toward the, towards the wealthy and connected. Congratulations, Eric Lipton. Again, investigative reporting. For a distinguished example of investigative reporting using any available journalistic tool, the Wall Street Journal staff for Medicare Unmask, a pioneering project that gave Americans unprecedented access to previously confidential data on the motivations and practices of their healthcare providers. Please come forward, Mike Sikinolfi, Stephanie Eaglin Fritz, John Carew, Christopher Weaver, and Tom McGinty, McGinty of the paper.
<laughs> she didn't mean that literally. <laughs> Thanks, Rose. Congratulations. Next, explanatory reporting. For a distinguished example of explanatory reporting that illuminates a significant and complex subject, demonstrating mastery of the subject, lucid writing, and clear presentation using any available journalistic tool, Zachary R. Meider of Bloomberg News for a painstaking, clear, and entertaining explanation of how so many U.S. corporations dodge taxes and why lawmakers and regulators have a hard time stopping them. Congratulations. Congratulations. Next, local reporting. For a distinguished example of reporting on significant issues of local concern, demonstrating originality and community expertise using any available journalistic tool, Rob Kuznia, Rebecca Kimmich, and Frank Sirachi of the Daily Breeze, Torrance, California, for their inquiry. for their inquiry into widespread corruption in small cash-strapped school district, including impressive use of the paper's website. Congratulations. Next is national reporting. For a distinguished example of reporting on national affairs using any available journalistic tool, Carol D. Lenig of the Washington Post for her smart, persistent coverage of the Secret Service, its, so, its security lapses, and the ways in which the agency neglected its vital task the protection of the President of the United States. Congratulations, Carol Lenny. Next is international reporting. For a distinguished example of reporting on international affairs using any available journalistic tool, the New York Times staff for courageous frontline reporting and vivid human stories on Ebola in Africa, engaging the public with the scope and details of the outbreak while holding authorities accountable Please come forward, Adam Nossiter, Ben Solomon, Sherry Fink, Helene Cooper, Pam Bellick, and Kevin Sack of the New York Times. Next is feature writing. For distinguished feature writing, giving prime consideration to quality of writing, originality, and concision, 
using any available journalistic tool, Diana Markham of the Los Angeles Times for her dispatches from California's Central Valley offering nuanced portraits of lives affected by the state's drought, bringing an original and empathic perspective to the story. Congratulations, Diana Markham. The next prize is for distinguished commentary. For distinguished commentary using any available journalistic tool, Lisa Falkenberg of the Houston Chronicle for vividly written groundbreaking columns about grand jury abuses that led to a wrongful conviction and other egregious problems in the legal and immigration systems. Congratulations, Lisa Falkenberg of the Houston Chronicle. Next is the prize for distinguished criticism. For distinguished criticism using any available journalistic tool, Mary McNamara of the Los, Los Angeles Times for savvy criticism that uses shrewdness, humor, and an insider's view to show how both subtle and seismic shifts in the cultural landscape affect television. Congratulations, Mary McNamara. Next is the prize for editorial writing. For distinguished editorial writing, the test of excellence being clearness of style, moral purpose, sound reasoning, and power to influence public opinion in what the writer conceives to be the right direction using any available journalistic tool. Kathleen Kingsbury of the Boston Globe for taking readers on a tour of restaurant workers' bank accounts to expose the real price of inexpensive menu items and the human costs of income inequality. Congratulations, Kathleen Kingsbury. Congratulations. Next, for editorial cartooning. For a distinguished cartoon or portfolio of cartoons characterized by originality, editorial effectiveness, quality of drawing, and pictorial effect, published as a still drawing, animation, or both, Adam Ziegler of the Buffalo News, who used strong images to connect with readers while conveying layers of meaning in a few words. Congratulations, Adam Siglis. Next is breaking news photography. For a distinguished example of breaking news photography in black and white or color, which may consist of a photograph or photographs, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch photography staff for powerful images of the despair and anger in Ferguson, Missouri. Stunning photojournalism that served the community 
while informing the country. Robert Cohen and David Carson of the Post-Dispatch will accept the award. Congratulations to them. How do you pronounce this one? How do you pronounce that? Um, I don't have my glasses on. Oh, that's all. Oh, right. look, I'll get it for you. Oh, it's. Um, Next is feature photography. For a distinguished example of feature photography in black and white or color, which may consist of a photograph or photographs, Daniel Behrulak, freelance photographer of the New York Times, for his gripping, courageous photographs of the Ebola epidemic in West Africa. Congratulations, Daniel Behrulak. Next is the Pulitzer Prize in Fiction. For a distinguished fiction by an American author, preferably dealing with American life. All the Light We Cannot See by Anthony Doerr, an imaginative and intricate novel inspired by the horrors of World War II and written in short, elegant chapters that explore human nature and the contradictory power of technology. Congratulations, Anthony Doerr. <laughs> Next is the Pulitzer Prize in Drama. For a distinguished play by an American author, preferably original in its source and dealing with American life. Between Riverside and Crazy by Stephen Adley Gurgis, a nuanced, beautifully written play about a retired police officer faced with eviction who uses dark comedy to confront questions of life and death. Congratulations, Adley Gurgis. I did it right. Next is the Pulitzer Prize in History. For a distinguished and appropriately documented book on the history of the United States. Encounters at the Heart of the World, a History of the Mandan People by Elizabeth A. Fenn. An engrossing original narrative showing the Mandans, a Native American tribe in the Dakotas, as a people with a history. Congratulations, Elizabeth Fenn. Next is the Pulitzer Prize in Biography. For a distinguished and appropriately documented biography or autobiography by an American author. 
the Pope and Mussolini, the secret history of Pius XI, and the rise of fascism in Europe by David I. Kurtzer, an engrossing dual biography that uses recently opened Vatican archives to shed light on two men who exercised nearly absolute power over their realms. Congratulations, David Kurtzer. Next, the Pulitzer Prize in Poetry. For a distinguished volume of original verse by an American author. Digest by Gregory Pardlow. Clear-voiced poems that bring readers the news from the 21st century America, rich with thought, ideas, and histories, public and private. Congratulations, Gregory Pardlow. Next, the prize for general nonfiction. For a distinguished and appropriately documented book of nonfiction by an American author that is not eligible for consideration in any other category. The Sixth Extinction and on Natural History by Elizabeth Colbert, an exploration of, of nature that forces readers to consider the threat posed by human behavior to a world of astonishing diversity. Congratulations, Elizabeth Colbert. The Pulitzer Prize in Music. For a distinguished musical composition by an American that has had its first performance or recording in the United States during the year. Anthracite Fields by Julia Wolfe, premiered on April 26, 2014, in Philadelphia by the Bang on the Can All Stars and the Mendelssohn Club Chorus a powerful oratorio for chorus and sextet, evoking Pennsylvania coal mining life around the turn of the 20th century. Congratulations, Julia Wolf. That uh, concludes our program. Please don't forget, uh, Pulitzer winners, to gather on the front steps for a photograph. The sun stayed out. The rain didn't come. Uh, congratulations once again to you all, and thank you very much.